Welcome to the last, uh, almost the last Queen's webinar of this semester. And today we are going to have Elisa Velotti, who is going to present uh, about gender and social networks. And Elisa Velotti is a senior lecturer in sociology and a member of the Mitchell Center for Social Network Analysis at the University of Manchester, in which she is right now, actually. She had published uh, on application of social network analysis and mixed methods in sociological fields such as criminal networks, scientific networks, and personal networks. And her recent work also focuses on gender aspects of social network formations and outcomes and health networks. She is the author of the book Qualitative Networks, Mixed Methods in Sociological Research and co-author of the social network analysis for EgoNets that maybe I later on going to post in the chat if you are interested on those two topics. So Elisa, you can now give us, uh, I can give you the stage to you right now and anything you can just say it, uh, and we are going to have some questions and comments later on. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, Francisca, and thanks for the Wind Society for inviting me. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to present, and I think the topic is very um, tailored to the, the scopes and the goals of the Wind Society. So what I'm presenting today is like, um, it's an overall reflection on gender and social networks. Um, it's based on a chapter that I wrote for the forthcoming book, in, of the stage handbook of social network analysis is in the second edition of um, a book that has already come out two years ago. Um, and now Peter Carrington, um, McLevy and Scott are creating the second edition. Um, I don't know when it's coming out, but it is coming out and there will be a chapter on gender and social networks. So today I'm gonna present briefly on um, I'm going to introduce, first of all, theories of gender, sociological theories of gender, in particularly um, feminism and uh, symbolic interactionism, which are very relevant if you want to look at um, how social network analysis can potentially contribute to the study of gender, both theoretically and methodologically. And then I'm going to um, build my, um, <clears throat> my argument around four main areas of research. Um, that have focused already on the, the aspects of gender in social network analysis, which are the socialization in the school environment, personal networks, organizational and business setting, and criminal networks. And I'm going to conclude with a brief discussion, but mainly what I really want to um, aim at is to uh, discuss the state of art and the open questions that my review will show. So I won't present any new uh, research, empirical research data, but I will overview current work that has already been done in the area of gender and social networks. So when we think about gender, especially in social sciences, we usually immediately think about feminism. And obviously feminism has been um, an incredibly important movement uh, to understand um, how gender per se is a social construction that is distinguished from the biological characteristics of sex. Um, and this is because it produces expectations in regards of the roles that men and women uh, stereotypically cover within a, within a society. Um, so these roles are historically shaped. So obviously they change over time, but feminism has shown quite extensively that um, <clears throat> more or less in, within all our society, uh, Western societies, uh, there have been um, distinctions between the, the, the roles that men and women are expected to cover. And usually these roles are hierarchically organized in a sense that men's roles are usually retained in a higher uh, status compared to female roles. So this creates gender inequalities, which then embed into what we normally call gender disparities and gender biases, where we, women are uh, implicitly or explicitly discriminated uh, compared to men. And then obviously this happens at, at different levels in different sectors in different societies and so on and so forth. But overall, that is the main contribution of feminism that not only open the studies of um, the, 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 the social approach to gender, but also uncovered um, long-standing discriminations. Uh, 
One aspect that is interesting um, in the study of gender is, is, is captured by role theory. Now, feminism, especially the second wave of feminism, has contested this idea of role, role theory applied to gender in a sense that it's weird to talk about men and women's roles. So you can talk about the role of a doctor or the role of a nurse, or of a nurse but there is nothing inherently male or female in a social role. However, we can intend roles as um, um, in, a re in, in a relational perspective. So instead of looking at roles, for example, in the view of structural functionalism, where a role is a box that people occupy with expectations um, attached to it, we look at roles as a set of independent, of interdependent social relationships. So we look at roles in network ways, where the roles then become this set of pattern and mutually interdependent social relations, social relations between a person and a social circuit. And these circles involve negotiating, um, negotiating duties and obligations, rights and privilege. So the more circles a person embeds to, and this argument re resem uh, reminds of Zimmel's idea of social circles, the more possibilities people have to differentiate the gender performance in the sense that if I have a circle, a familiar circle, I might have um, a different way of performing my femininity compared to a working circle. And the more circles I'll embed to, the more I can differentiate my um, gender performance. However, also like the more circles I have, the higher might be the burden. Um, on myself, because obviously the demands on individuals multiply and sometimes they might even contradict. So this brings us to the role of social interactionism, which has been, again, very key uh, key in defining gender studies. And the, the, the contribution of uh, social uh, symbolic interaction theory is mainly toward the idea that gender is not an attribute that we are born with, but it's a practice that we do on a daily basis. And we do it in social interaction. So in these interactions, people constantly characterize themselves and others by attributing gender identity. We do, it, we do this sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, but those um, neutral attribution of gender identities carry normative expectations of appropriateness. So we, unconsciously or consciously and directly or indirectly judge people based on how they perform their gender identity. And in doing this, uh, in doing gender, in, um, in <clears throat> evaluating the appropriateness of gender performance of ourselves and others, we every day reaffirm or challenge the normative expectations attached to gender performances. And, uh, and we normally t um, hold ourselves and others accountable for their gender appropriate behavior. And one aspect, one concept that I find very interesting in social interactionism is the one of network accountability, uh, which means that when, um, when we call others accountable for their gender performance, we don't just do it that individually, but usually we call in um, a network around us as a mean of social control. And, and the, the actor, the, the, the network will come in to reinforce our um, uh, expectations of appropriateness. Think, think for example, uh, a student in a classroom that comes in and is not dressed accordingly to the rules, and the teacher will call in, um, I don't know, the principals or the parents to reinforce their judgment of the appropriateness of the dressing. And this is called network accountability. So <clears throat> from the theories of genders, we see that we, we learn that individuals learn to interact appropriately according to the gender they are assigned at birth. And those expectations, the, the gender expectations are reinforced, usually reinforced in their social circles. Although obviously like you know, by diversifying our social circles, we might also um, entangle ourselves in social circles that are trying to uh, contest the gender, the, the, the dominant gender expectation. However, because most of the social circles tend to reinforce those gender expectations, um, we tend to assign certain roles predominantly to men and women. And therefore, because we assign, because men and women tend to occupy these roles predominantly, we end up um, characterizing these roles 
more and more by gender stereotypes, which is why, for example, we expect a surgeon normally to be a man, um, people working in the army more to be men, uh, while other uh, jobs like nurses or teachers are usually more stereotypically feminine. Um, but that is not because there is anything uh, inherently male or female in those roles. It's just because they are traditionally occupied by men and women. So how does social network theory can help to understand how gender is performed, reinforced, and contested? Well, theories of social networks can help because we can expect gender performance to facilitate the formation of networks that are typically masculine and feminine. In other words, if men and women, if men and women occupy different positions in, in social networks, then we can expect their social circle to differentiate accordingly, and therefore the opportunities and demand that is placed upon them to vary accordingly. On the other hand, when we look at social network theory, we can hypothesize that if men and women over their lifetime build different social networks, then they should they should probably have uh, they, they should probably obtain different outcomes. So these are the two aspects that I'm interested in looking at. First, if men and women develop different networks uh, based on the opportunities and constraints that they face in their everyday life. And second, if because they build, if they build different networks, if they also obtain different returns uh, from these networks. And I'm going to do it in, uh, I'm going to look at these uh, two different aspects of formation and outcome in different settings. The first of which is school networks. Um, so most of the research that looked at gender difference in social networks has come from um, the study of uh, school networks, which is the classic studies in social network analysis. We have plenty of data in schools from many parts of the world. Most of the studies tend to concentrate on um, adolescents and pre-adolescents. We have few studies on younger kids and some studies at university. So what we see, especially from a very young age, and there are a few studies that have shown this, is that, well, most of the, the studies that we know that we look at look um, show that boys and girls in schools tend to interact in same sex groups. The, 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 the male groups tend to be larger, while girls seem to prefer to prefer one-to-one -one friendship. So why is it that boys end up in larger groups and girls end up in more dyadic relationships? Well, one theory says that it, it, uh, the, 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 the difference is, how, is in how boys and girls resolve um, transitive trials. So some studies show that when you have two boys um, who are friends with each other and a third boy um, show an interest in becoming friends with one of them, then usually what happens is that the, the pair of, of children who are already friends tend to include the third person. Uh, and therefore, uh, the open triad or the, the potential triad become transitive over time. While this doesn't seem to happen for, for girls, so when a, a two girls are mutually friends and there is a third girl asking to become friends with them, usually what happens is that this girl, this girl uh, is rejected. So overall, we, we, seem to, uh, we, we seem to find a prevalence of, of what we call the intransitive triad between um, all girls. Some studies also show that these aspects of gender interact with hierarchy. So popular students will drop ties in order to, um, with less popular kids in, in order to maintain their popularity. And because boys tend to have greater shared understanding about who is popular, they tend also to, de they tend also to, develop, to, to develop better hierarchies than girls. So the studies in school show that there might be some gender mechanisms that explain why boys and girls end up, end up in different uh, network configurations. The boys in larger groups, the girls in dyadic friendships. When we look at the gender in the, 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 the gender personal network in other life, again, we have plenty of data. We now have um, large data sets that collect information about personal networks in many different countries. And what all these uh, studies seem to show is that women's personal networks tend to shrink in size, especially when they get married and they have children. And those networks also tend to involve more kings and neighbors compared to the, the one of men. 
Uh, we know that parenthood tend to force more women out of employment, but even for those who keep their jobs, their opportunities to socialize are constrained by household and care responsibilities. So they still end up with smaller networks with more kings and neighbors compared to um, their male counterparts. counterparts. So what's happening is also that because women tend to carry the burden of emotional work with family and friends, and this is another thing that we find more, more or less constant in all the studies of personal networks, then the more ties they have, the more demands are placed, are placed upon them. So their ties are more demanding emotionally and in terms of time than the ties that men have. And therefore, women um, face these burdens by cutting off relationships, so shrinking their networks even more. It's not only that the, the women networks are um, smaller than men, but also they differ in terms of the variety of jobs that they their contacts do, and therefore the type of jobs they might get access to. This is the idea of run of vector. So uh, if we have less weak ties and our weak ties are very um, are less diverse, then we end up with less job leads. Uh, this is something that we see again consistently in in uh, in studies of personal networks, and we see that we, women tend to end up trapped in what we call the horizontally segregated networks. Um, now, one aspect that is interesting here is that this could also set an example for younger generations. So, because women tend to be more um, dedicated to the emotional work and to have smaller networks, while men uh, might have larger and more heteropolous network, but also more superficial, these might teach their kids a different type of relational style, which, which then um, give an, an example for young boys to be more inclusive, um, while for, for young girls to be more attentive to dyadic relationships. So it could potentially explain why we see different network formations in kids, although there is no empirical evidence so far that links the two, the personal networks in other lives with the school networks of kids. Now, another area of research that has been, that has extensively looked at the role of women in networks comes from business and organizational studies. And here we have um, different types of hypotheses. One from the most famous is one of Ron Barth, um, who, who says that brokerage seems to favor individual success, uh, but also that sometimes constraint might facilitate collaborations. But these results are very unclear uh, when they are applied to women. Um, so for example, Bart says that women tend to be promote, promoted earlier when they have less brokerage and more constraint, but also a, um, a study from Brandes and Kirchhoff shows that they are usually misperceived when they occupy brokerage roles. So even when they are in brokerage, brokerage position, they're not recognized as such, and therefore they don't get the same outcome that men have when they're brokers. While Ibarra uh, shifted the, discu the discussion not so much on the network structure, but more in, on, in terms of network composition. So Ibarra says that, um, individual success is increased when we interact, we collaborate with powerful people. And because these powerful people tend to be men, so the, the, the network is more favorable to women when it's heteropolis, when, when, when women interact with men or collaborate with men, while it's more successful for um, if it's homophilous for men, because men will interact with powerful people of same gender. So, <clears throat> This idea of a different type of natural structure and composition doesn't seem to hold when we look at the very top of elite and business networks. So when we look, and there are very few studies that look at very elitarian top business networks, simply because there are many, <laughs> very few women at the very top of these elites that we can use to compare their structure, their natural structure to the one of men. So the few studies that have managed to compare the, the network structure and composition of men and women at the top of the elites and business networks show that there are not many differences. However, when we look at the qualitative um, accounts of um, those people in similar positions, we see that actually sitting on executive board of top firms doesn't automatically translate in equal returns for women. 
So women at the top of these um, elite networks, when interviewed, they say that they still lack networking opportunities and they were normally excluded from the old boys network. They said that usually the male bonding happens outside um, the board of directors, for example, in golf courts or uh, during drinking times. And when women try to set up their own female networking programs, they are usually met with derogatory comments. So, for example, they say that they, they are suspected of male bashing intent, but also they if they set up their own uh, networking events, then they are at risk of reproducing those gender segregated networks that mean that um, relocate women into um, is isolate me women from the center of power. So there is a theory that says that the the the, the network structure of organization has an important um, role in shaping the the outcomes that men and women can have from their organizational network. So when we have organizations with flat hierarchies and an equal balance between men and women, then we women are usually less um, discriminated or less, they, they, are, they experience less inequalities because the gender frame by which we usually evaluate uh, people we work with is less salient. But the same flat hierarchies with a predominant, with pre, a predominant um, number of men will end up recreating that informal structure of the old boys network so the gender frame becomes more relevant and therefore because hierarchies are flat then they're also more informal and women end up being more discriminated so in those uh, contexts where which are male dominated women seem to um, have better outcomes when the hierarchies are well defined when there are formal rules or gender equal equality policies that level out the gender stereotypes and the um, and the old boys network. Now this is interesting because it brings us to our last example, which is the example of gender in criminal networks. So when we think about in criminal networks, especially when we think about criminal enterprises, um, these are obviously informal markets which are completely exempt from gender equality policies. They're also predominantly masculine. Uh, and they tend to relegate women to the margins of the criminal, criminal network. So the few studies that have looked at the position of women in those criminal networks, they show how they need to rely on influential men to exercise and maintain their power. So they really, it really shows that they have to borrow the social capital in the same way that Ron Barthes describes um, the borrowed social capital for uh, women in organizations. Now, other studies, this is um, Peter Carrington paper, actually, he looked at um, how, how the, uh, the role of women in different types of crime. So he says that females um, are excluded from collaborations with uh, men, more in robbery, assault, and minority, but uh, they are much more collaborating in case of violent crimes, drug trafficking, and especially in sex crimes against children, where women are particularly valued for their male co-offenders for recruiting and grooming children. So women might occupy less central and more segregated position in a network, but they might still be strategic for certain criminal activities, thanks, for, thanks to their relative invisibility, also to, to the fact that the gender stereotype usually assign them to, peri to peripheral positions in these networks. And this is something that has, has emerged quite clearly in the study of mafia type of organizations, where the scholars have came up with this idea of submerged centrality. So what happens in case of submerged centrality is like when uh, mafia leaders um, are incarcerated or on the run, they temporarily delegate the power to their wives or the, the female um, the, female actors in their families, uh, which then become the, some a kind of a hidden central actor. So they will they they act on behalf of the of the leaders, but more in, in a hidden position. So they're not clearly um, the the bosses of the, the families. So again, but again these opportunities in, in the mafia type organization seems to be related to the higher or lower hierarchical structure of the criminal network. So for example, 
it shows it seems to be much more relevant in um, in Neapolitan mafia, which is much more flat in terms of the organizations of those families, while it's less um, it's less clear in Sicilian type of mafia, which is much more hierarchical. So to come to discuss what we what we've seen so far, what I think is that social network theory really offered the possibility of looking at gender inequalities as they play out in the network structure. So, for example, the longitudinal longitudinal analysis of school networks allow us to observe how the network configurations and gender relations style co-evolve, um, and how they might be learned from families where personal networks um, differentiate the role of men and women in those families. We, the personal network surveys um, give indication of network structure and composition and available re resources for different social groups. So, so far I discussed differences between men and women, but obviously like, we could identify pockets of vulnerability and social exclusions when we also look at low income, older age, migration, or hard to reach population. So, uh, so, for example, the, the difference in the network structure and composition and outcome might be um, harsher if we start intersecting um, women of different ethnic backgrounds of older women compared to younger women. And the systematic comparison of organizational structure and gender outcome is also useful to test how effective are gender policies but also how to tailor those gender policies depend on the structure of the organization. So we could consider if these are less or more homophilous or less or more hierarchical and tailor the gender policy accordingly. And on, in all of these, I think we should use criminal networks as, as control cases, as cases where we cannot use gender policies, we cannot intervene directly. And therefore we can see what happens when those, um, in those cases where we cannot engineer a reduction of gender inequality. Now, obviously, like criminal networks have a lot of other problems to tackle, which is, for example, the, the missing data or the difficulties in tackling um, in understanding the relationships and so on and so forth. But I see, I think it's a very promising area to look at uh, gender differences in network structures and outcomes. So my proposal as a research agenda is that we should update and diversify personal network surveys. So we do have now the surveys that come from many different countries. So in the past, most of the, the surveys were from, from the US, Well, now we start having um, surveys from low-income countries and for diverse group of populations. And here it's interesting to see uh, how gender intersect with other macrocultural factors like class, ethnicity, or non-binary gender, gender identities, for which so far, as far as I know, we have near, nearly to none um, idea of how the personal networks um, are structured. We should also capitalize on the large amount of social network data that we have already collected and for, me, for which we do have information on gender. So, in specifically, I think it would be interesting to look at how gender interplay in different types of relationships. So for example, for school networks, now we have several studies that collect information, not only on friendship, but also on conflicts, um, dislike, disesteem, and, and things like that. So how it's interesting, it would be interesting to see how men and women resolve relational conflicts in a similar or different way. But also how these um, relational uh, dynamics change when we look at, at, at same-sex ties and cross-sex ties, because obviously, like those, add uh, another level of complexity to our uh, analysis. A meta-analysis of social networks across school and organization might also reveal interesting factors that go beyond the microstructure organizations or relationships, but and link those type of schools and organizations to the, um, the social, cultural, and economic background of the data. So, for example, we cannot expect organizations and schools in different countries to uh, show the same dynamics, the same gender dynamics. Um, and also by, by looking at how gender stereotypes and hierarchies reproduce in social networks, we could start tackling gender inequalities that affect not only women, but people of every gender, because as I said, this is an area that is completely unta um, untapped by social network studies. 
So that is all for me. And I'm going to open the discussion. And I hope you enjoyed. And let me know if it wasn't clear. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I think we all agree it was a great presentation. And I see a lot of us, actually, <laughs> a lot of applause in the reactions uh, of the participants. So that's great. Now it would be great if just to hear from the participants if you have any questions, comments, or anything that you would like to share about this topic. And I see Alice. Thank you so much, Eliza, for this really interesting talk. It's been really, um, I haven't thought of gender as a network defined property, and that's going to be sticking in my head now for, for a long time. Um, I, when you mentioned that the social networks that women build tend, at least from some of the data sets that you looked at, to indicate that they have uh, less leverage in finding jobs, for example, because of the social network structure. I was wondering whether the, there's some evidence the other way around where you say, okay, the, the social networks that men and women tend to have are different, and the ones that men ha tend to have um, more good for networking and finding jobs, and the ones that women have might be better to help with in, in terms of helping with traditional women um, expected tasks like care networks or something like that? Uh, well, I think more than posing it in this way, because obviously the problem that we have is that there's still this kind of hierarchies of expectation. So you still have that being um, a surgeon or being the principal of a school, it's it's um, evaluated in higher esteem, esteem than being a nurse or being a teacher. Okay, so that is the first thing we need to think that, of course, women's networks are much more uh, resourceful. If we look, for example, of someone who can look after our children, or if we want to have certain kind of jobs, for example, nursing or caring or teaching. Uh, but there, there's still a hierarchy in in this in the way in which we consider these uh, occupations. Now, the other interesting aspect is that the gender stereotypes work the other way around as well. So they also exclude men from gen from uh, roles that are traditionally attributed to women. So qualitative research, for example, show how men tend to be excluded from school networks, from parent networks, because when they when they go to the playground with their kids, usually there are, there are very few fathers compared to the number of mothers. And therefore, it's very difficult for men to build homophilous networks and therefore networks of support when they step in into these gender, in, into these highly feminine roles. Uh, so what I think it's interesting in, in, a, in using a relational approach is that it, it really helps you to go beyond the masculine and feminine distinction. And therefore it looks how gender stereotypes work yeah, both ways, but also they work for people of, who don't identify themselves with binary, um, with binary genders, for which we know very little, uh, especially from, from a network perspective, because we have no data. So most of the data that we have collected so far when we look at uh, personal networks or school networks or organizational networks, tend to classify men and women as boy and girls or men and women. So there is no, there is no, I, I haven't found so far any data sets that actually investigate uh, a nuanced perception of, uh, of gender from the participants. Um, but they, the, the stereotypes work both ways. Thank you, this is super interesting. Jenna, I see that you have your hand raised if you want. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. This is a really interesting talk. I just wanted to follow up on your last comment about gender binaries, because this is something I've been thinking a lot about in my school-based research and how we do have so little data that um, doesn't just focus on gender binaries, girls versus boys. And I'm wondering, um, what would your ideal data set look like if you could have a data set that was able to get at gender in a maybe more continuous or fluid fashion? Um, what might that look like and how would we incorporate networks into that? Uh, 
So I don't know what would be my ideal network, but I did come across a very interesting study that was done in a school where it was a longitudinal network study. So they look at the network of, of pupils at a certain point, and then they follow them up for, I think, about a year. And they didn't ask their gender, but they asked, I think what they did was like, you know, to, there was a, a like a Richter scale where they had to position themselves according to different feminine and masculine attributes. And then they created this like gender profile that was measured on many different aspects. I don't know, for example, uh, aggressiveness or emotional display, the, the, um, uh, display and things like that. And then they look at how this, and also I think if, if I remember correctly, they asked the rest of the network of the class network to define the gender of each and every, everyone else. Again, on a scale. So how masculine and feminine you think each of the other students is. And then they look at how the, the personal perception of themselves changed across time based on the perception that others have on them. And what they show is that, especially pupils who are um, victims of bullying and naming and uh, homophobia, tend to end up perceiving themselves much more at the extreme of their gender identity. So it's like their gender identity becomes enhanced by the fact that people address them much more with a gender frame. So I think what would be, and I mean, and it's hard when you do like representative samples of the, of a population and you have these five minutes in which you can ask about <laughs> one natural question. And it's really hard to then also embed some kind of um, in-depth investigation of the gender uh, attribution and perception. But I think there is some there there are some studies that show how our gender perception of ourselves really is influenced by the way in which the network around us perceive us. Um, so I think how what would be the ideal data set? I'm not entirely sure, but I think that we should work on trying to find how to measure that properly. Thanks. Thank you, Jena, for that question. Um, I don't know if there are other comments or questions over there, because I have a couple, and <laughs> maybe I can use this opportunity. <laughs> but I'm going to ask one, uh, which was actually a little bit related with what you were just talking about uh, how we measure these things. And I was wondering if you have any ideas of what would it be uh, a good research in future to measure the performance of gender? Because you were talking a little bit about that in the beginning and how we perform the genders may be different and thus for maybe complicated to actually measure and it could be a challenge in itself. So I don't know if you have seen any research doing that or looking to do that in the future or how so would you, you mean how how we measure the gender performance exactly yeah i think i mean some studies that have i mean some of the original studies of network analysis were using a lot of observations so instead of relying on um questionnaires they were observing how people interact um so when you observe how people interact with each other, then you can also probably observe the gender performance a bit better. Uh, now, we should then define what we mean with gender performance. So for example, I would probably add, uh, if, if you're studying a small network in an organization, for example, um, I would probably observe how people interact with each other and then ask how, how what, what would be the characteristic of behavior that people consider feminine and masculine. And part of it has been done by the paper that I mentioned of uh, Brandis and Kindle, because they have a measure of collaboration, uh, but also of uh, the perceived femininity and masculinity of people in the office. So they ask people like how on a scale from one to 10, how masculine this, per this person is or how feminine she is. Um, and that was, it. again, it was very interesting because they they that's where they see that if women occupy 
position, for example, brokerage position, which I usually uh, assign to, um, to men, they tend to be considered less feminine. Um, and Jimmy is asking, asking if I have the link on the paper that I just yeah. mentioned. I don't know if, if, if it's the one, <clears throat> which one? <laughs> the, one with, uh, the one with the scale? I think that one is the, the one that you were just describing. Yep. Yeah. This one. Okay, well, I'll, uh, um, I'll send you the, the, the detail. Once we finish the questions, I'm just going to retry <laughs> it and then... Um, Thank you. And we have another question that I see in the chat, actually, from Ella Lee, and she said that it's a little bit noisy, apparently, where she is, but she's saying that, are there any particular considerations or concerns through the gender social networks data collection process? Uh, I don't think that there is any, uh, I can't really think about any concern about the uh, collecting information on gender in social networks that goes beyond any concern that you might have when you collect information. So, of course, like, you know, when you ask people about their um, their gender identity, that is per se considered a sensitive topic. Uh, I don't think it's, it's sensitive if we do interviews and it's sensitive if we do ethnographic work and it's sensitive if we do surveys and it's still sensitive if we collect metadata. data. So I think that the usual um, consideration and concern apply here. Um, now, what I think would be really important is that if we stop for a second collecting data, <laughs> really analyze what we already have there because we have beyond millions of network data that have never been analyzed using a gender perspective. And I think we should probably start learning from what we have already collected um, because that would probably also tell us much more what is it that we need to measure that it wasn't measured and that we, were, we are missing in the data that we already have. Thanks, uh, Ella, yeah, for I your thought. answer. And I think see your heart as an answer, so probably she likes your answer, Elisa. <laughs> and I see that there is another hand raise. Ella, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hi. Good morning. And this is so interesting and fun. I have one question regarding your gender. I, I understand your perspective of analyzing what we already have. Um, my research is on online learning networks and networks of people who might not disclose their gender or their names, and specifically people who use like nicknames. And I've been really curious about the how gender works in that regard. After discussing with some researchers, there are some people who have packages to predict your gender based on the nickname use and all of that. But I wanted to ask you more. What is your perspective when one cannot actually know gender because of their they, their nicknames or things like that? Like, how would you do in, in networks that are not collected through the survey way? That is the traditional way. Uh, well, that's a very interesting question, and I'm afraid I, I I don't really have an answer for it. First of all, because I know very little about online uh, social networks. I mean, one thing that I know um, about those networks is that especially I think in video games, what people have discussed is the fact that, that that is very much a place where people perform gender. So disregarding their, their biological sex, they actually enact a character which might or might not have some gender characteristics. Now, what I would find more interesting there is like in the case of, so what, what do you see that is different in the performance of people who clearly identify their nicknames with some type of gender, regardless of if the same gender that they have in real life or not, and people who don't have a nickname that is related to gender? So do they behave differently? Can you identify more or less masculinity and femininity trained in their interactions online? Because that is something 
Everywhere else, we cannot go beyond the fact that when we see someone, we immediately attribute some gender uh, characteristics. Um, so, for example, like, you know, when you see someone who is more gender fluid, you would probably ask yourself, right, is that a man or a woman? Because we are so used to, to impose so some of the theorists of uh, gender says that like gender is our main frame of classifying people and automatically we don't we can't go beyond that so it's interesting in an online context because obviously like you know we don't in directly interact with people so even if we might ask if people are men or or, or or women we first of all it might not directly relate to who they are and second it might become irrelevant at a certain point because people don't disclose feminine or masculine traits so it would be interesting to understand how they do it. Thank you. You gave me you gave me a lot of ideas. Perhaps not answers for ideas. <laughs> That's a way better. Thank you. Thanks, Ella. Any last ones? I think we already have a lot of questions, and I know Elisa has uh, to do a class right now. So maybe oh, yeah, we still have 10 minutes, so I still have a little bit of time. OK. <laughs> I don't have to prepare for the other class. I just have to log in and appear. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I see no more questions or hand raised, but I see some thank yous in the chat. So thank you very much, Lisa, for being here, for talking about this interesting topic. And we are going to be uploading this video later on. So if you want to see it again or anything, it's going to be in the YouTube channel of Women in Network Science. So thank you very much, everyone, to was, Thanks for having was here. Sure. Um, I hope I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.